question for those of you who might be looking at this slide. I want to know how many of you in the audience see a typo. Potentially? Look carefully. It's sort of hard to see because it's in yellow, but that's the clue. The typo is in, in the yellow font. People seeing it yet? Yes, we're talking about mania symptoms. But for bipolar depression with mixed features, it's three plus depressive symptoms, right? And then on the unipolar side, it's three plus manic or hypomanic symptoms. And either of those puts you in a mixed feature phenomenon. Notice it's true for unipolar and bipolar. So this was my check to see how many of you were paying attention. And in this next slide, we're going to talk about first the impact of mixed features. Really, we all know family history and suicidality, antidepressant-induced mania, all of these young age of onset. This is what is my bread and butter as a child and adolescent psychiatrist, even uh, gender bias towards females. And then, of course, all of the comorbidities that come with this, poor prognostication, poor impulse control, so substance use. These are all things that culminate in the mixed feature space. This stuff isn't just a whiff or just a little bit impactful. This has serious consequences for our patients. And if I had to poll all of you, even if you said you didn't see a patient with mixed features, I bet you're seeing all of these issues coming up with your patients more often than not. So if you appreciate that these issues, these risk factors, these features are important, then we should be thinking very systematically about how to understand them. Interestingly, we've got a wide distribution of very nonspecific symptoms that also seem to cohere with mixed features. Among the most common being psychomotor agitation, irritability, and distractibility, but, uh -uh, sorry, wrong, can't use those symptoms in the DSM criteria if you think about it in a very exclusionary fashion. Well, we know from our friend Roger McIntyre that there's lots of great ways to remember the mixed feature symptom frameworks. We've got anxiety, we've got agitation, we've got anger and irritability, attentional disturbance and distractibility, and anhedonia, all pointing to really difficult to treat symptoms. These are symptoms that you and I know we are going to struggle and iterate with with these patients, but these are also highly suggestive of mixed features. So you might be saying, hey, Dr. Singh, are you just talking about difficult to treat symptoms? Is that what this is all about? Is that what mixed features are? Well, maybe, but then what, what should we do about it? How should we understand them diagnostically? So DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, went through a little bit of a, an evolution, as you will, on how to understand this. Before, if you recall in DSM-4, there was actually a requirement that you had to have a juxtaposition a juxtaposition of a manic episode with a depressive episode, right? How hard is that? was that to find, a mixed episode? Super hard, right? And also, most of the common symptoms of DMX are excluded from D uh, DSM-5 mixed feature criteria, where they tried to do this three plus of hypomania in a de major depressive episode, or three plus of depression in a bipolar um, manic or hypomanic episode, which made it a little bit easier to understand mixed features and dimensionalize them, so they're not just this categorical episode of mixed episode, but we didn't bring to the party some really important central symptoms. And we worry that maybe excluding them could actually lead to misdiagnosis and potentially harmful treatments. So the general guidance is for us to not exclude those common symptoms, agitation, irritability, or distractibility. We gotta think about them. We have to think about them in the context of other risk factors like family history and age of onset because a young age of onset combined with a family history is gonna make you invariably at risk for having a mixed feature presentation. And four times as many cases of DMX were identified using that more inclusive research-based criteria. So you're 
chances of actually identifying it are better. Compare that to non-DSM criteria for DMX, and you can see how probabilistic, how specific and sensitive you are with the Benazi criteria to be able to be more inclusive. You're hitting both specificity and sensitivity, which is important for ruling in and ruling out disorders. So let's move on to help you appreciate that if you miss it, it will never be identified. If you include it, it will be identified. And which is more potentially detrimental? Missing it or what? Treating unidentified DMX with antidepressants. That's the worry here. Because if you treat a patient with an antidepressant with mixed features, their likelihood of experiencing an antidepressant-induced mania is actually three times higher than it is if they didn't have mixed features. So this is the vicious cycle that we run into, right? Treatment uh, years or often a decade or more of unnecessary suffering, misdiagnoses one after the other, treatment resistance, reduced likelihood of response to appropriate treatments. Then you have treatment emergent activation because you're treating them with antidepressants and then treatment emergent mania. So activation turns into mania. Sometimes that also evolves to suicidality. And then again, the circle vicious cycle continues.